A Clockwork Orange Book Summary by Audiobook Academy. Anthony Burgess dystopian future novel, A Clockwork Orange, was released in 1962. Burgess invented a vernacular that includes English Cockney rhyming slang, modified Slavic terms, and many phrases that Burgess made up himself in the course of writing the book. The slang is known as Slang in the novel is referred to as Nastat, and it appears throughout the narrative, which is written in a stream of consciousness style. It was coined by Burgess for the book, and ultraviolent specifically refers to acts of severe and frequently artistic violence. Malcolm McDowell and Stanley Kubrick starred in and directed the 1971 film adaptation of the book. Alex, a 15 year old teenager who goes out with his drugs every night to drink hallucinogen laced cocktails and engage in senseless violence, is the protagonist of the novel. Once Alex is arrested for the robbery and murder of an elderly woman, authorities place him in jail where he receives an experimental treatment aimed at curbing his violent tendencies by making him link violence with being ill in the process. The therapy is a success, and Alex is freed from prison a changed man who is unable to contemplate or carry out any acts of violence without being violently ill and vomiting. By kidnapping Alex and torturing him, the political demonstrators hope to put the blame on the jail system for Alex's success with the treatment in the newspaper. However, Alex is hospitalized after he jumps out of a window and flees. In the hospital, he is able to conduct violence again without getting sick since he has been deprogrammed. When Alex is released from the hospital, he discovers that his taste for violence has shifted, and he joins a new gang. Supnosis. In the near future, Alex, the main character, hangs out with his gang, Pete, Georgie, and Dim, at a pub called the Corova, where they drink drug-laced milk. They drink and talk about what they're going to do with their night while Alex, our narrator explains the girls in the bar and their reactions to their milk plus cocktails. One of the bar's customers, Alex points out, is slouched over and muttering incoherently after downing a large amount of the milk. Alex takes the gang out of the bar and onto the street, where they come across an elderly guy who had just returned from the local library. Laughing at the elderly guy, the boys take apart his books, yank out his false teeth, and rip off his clothes. After that, he is left alone in the street. There are four older women who flirt with them when the boys purchase them drinks at Duke of New York Bar. The group spend all of the money they had stolen and realized that they needed to steal more money. A short time later, they rob a corner business, beating the owner and his wife before stealing their money and running away. The drugs return to the Duke of New York after robbing the store to spend more time with the ladies. During questioning by law enforcement, the women claim that they were with them the entire time. The police are powerless to stop the boys, so they mock them. After leaving the bar, the boys stumble across an elderly man who is singing songs in the street as he is inebriated. Despite being assaulted, the assailant continues to sing. To persuade the man to shut up, Dim gives him a good mouth punch. At this point, Alex becomes intrigued in the conversation and asks if the man would like to continue with his thoughts on the current status of the globe. Apparently, he believes that young people are taking over everything, and that even as an elderly man, he faces physical abuse on a regular basis. It is due of his intoxication that the lads are not afraid of him, he informs them. Once again, the boys begin pounding him and continue to do so until he begins vomiting blood. The boys come encounter another group of drugs as they continue their walk. It is Billy Boy's turn to take on the other drugs, and he has no intention of backing down. As Alex and his gang begin to have the upper hand, nearby sirens go off. Alex and his drugs take cover in an alleyway between two apartment buildings as the rival gangs disperse in all directions. While taking a breather, Alex peeks into one of the homes and notices that the state has turned on the televisions in every room to broadcast a worldwide cast. In the middle of the night, Alex spots Tim staring at the sky and tells him they need a car. After successfully stealing a car, the young men decide to do the old surprise visit by breaking into a house. Alex approaches the woman in the house for a glass of water in a friendly manner, and the boys follow suit. Naturally, the boys push past her and don their masks as soon as she opens the door. A Clockwork Orange is the working title of the woman's husband's latest manuscript. Before tearing the text to shreds, the guys make fun of the title. The group restrains and beats the writer despite his best efforts to defend himself. Alex is appalled by Georgie and Pete's raid on the pantry. While he and Dim rape his wife, he instructs them to keep the writing in their hands so they can read it afterward. Droogs return to their car and leave the residence after finishing their performance. While at the Conovo Milk Bar, the group notices a large number of new customers. Tim makes fun of a woman who sings a few bars from an opera to Alex. Alex becomes upset and punches Tim in the mouth after calling him a filthy drooling mannerless bastard. A fight breaks out between the two lads, and Pete steps in to mediate. 
Alex reminds them that he is the leader and Dim has to learn his place, while the other lads are reluctant to voice up because they are terrified of Alex. Dim ends the debate by suggesting that they all retire to their rooms and get some sleep. Alex exits the pub with a razor in his hand in anticipation of Billy Boy's gang's revenge for Alex. Alex makes his way back to his mother's apartment, where he eats the meal she's made for him in her kitchen. Alex listens to classical music on his stereo before going to sleep and reflects on what he read from the manuscript he received from the writer's residence the previous day. Alex complains to his mother the following morning that he is too weary to go to school. However, she agrees to let him stay at home, despite her reservations. State-mandated employment is required for adults upon graduation from school, and Alex's father works at the dye works while his mother sells food at a state-run market. Alex goes back to sleep and is startled up by the doorbell ringing once more. PR Deltoid, Alex's post-corrective advisor, is at the door. Deltoid informs Alex that the authorities are on the lookout for him and his group as a result of their confrontation with Billy Boy. However, Deltoid does not believe Alex, despite Alex's assurances that he is innocent. A police officer will want to question Alex, he urges Alex to avoid difficulty. After Deltoid has left, Alex concludes that he has no cause for concern. Alex believes that a government that forbids its citizens from misbehaving is depriving them of their humanity. Alex adores breaking the law and has no intention of stopping. Alex scoffs at the modern youth feature in the newspaper as he eats his breakfast. His mind drifts to an idea about how art appreciation could reduce the violence among today's kids. For Alex, this is absurd because violence has always been an artistic medium. Alex heads out of his parents' house to visit the record store. The two ten-year-old girls meet him there and agree to accompany him back to his apartment so they may enjoy some classical music. His plan is to get them drunk and then rape them once they arrive at his place of business. Alex falls asleep listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony after the girls have left in fits of laughter. Alex waits till the wee hours of the morning to see the droogs again, dismissing his parents' concerns. This leads to another confrontation between Alex and the droogs. All of Alex's friends inform him that they want a more democratic group and have come up with a plan for the night on their own. Upon hearing portions of Beethoven's violin concerto, Alex cuts himself before they can even get out of the building. After a long scuffle, Alex finally manages to hack off Georgie's hand. Alex manages to slash Dim's wrist with a knife while Dim pursues him with a chain. Pete is on the sidelines, paralyzed by fear and concerned for Dim. With triumph in his hands and the Duke of New York in his sights, Alex heals Dim's wound personally and brings them to him. George then informs him of Georgie's intention to plunder the manse, an ancient, affluent estate. It is Alex's intention to demonstrate his authority by having the lads lift him into a high window so that he can enter the manse on his own. An elderly woman sits in the center, surrounded by a swarm of cats. In his haste to rob her of all she holds dear, Alex is deterred by a bust of Beethoven on the mantel as he comes up behind her. The old woman begins striking Alex with her cane when he stumbles on a milk dish placed out for the kitties. Despite Alex's efforts, one of the cats that attack him manages to get a foot in his mouth and kills him. This time, Alex falls and the elderly woman summons her cats to attack him. Alex is surprised by the cat's behavior. She falls on the floor unconscious when Alex strikes her with a silver statue from the mantel. A siren from the cops outside causes him to realize that he must flee. On the other side of town, Dim is waiting for him and whipping him with his chain. Droogs chuckle while the rest of the droogs rush away. During the beating, Alex is taunted by the police. Alex asks for a lawyer in the police station and is scoffed at and abused by the officers. Alex receives a visit from PR Deltoid, who spits in his face before he leaves. Alex is compelled to make a statement confessing to his misdeeds by police. Alex spills the beans on everything he's done in the last 24 hours, including his buddy's betrayal. When the police take Alex into custody, he is sent in a waiting cell with two other inmates who are trying to molestation him. When Alex finally does fall asleep, he has a dream in which he is listening to Beethoven. He imagines violent lyrics to Ode to Joy. A police officer awakens him the following morning to inform him that the elderly woman he abused the night before had passed away. Alex is condemned to 14 years in a state prison after numerous court appearances and testimony from PR Deltoid. For the duration of his incarceration, the man is issued a unique identifier and told he will only be recognized by this number. We learn over time that Alex's first two years in prison were a nightmare. Assaults from fellow inmates and prison officers are a daily occurrence in the workshop where he works. A criminal by nature, he hopes he could return to his former life as an outcast. He is thrilled to learn that Georgie was killed while robbing a house with Dim and Pete. Alex is given a new position at the prison, this time as the person in charge of the prison chaplain's stereo. 
This is something he adores and admires the work of Charlie Chaplin. The Chaplin urges Alex to read the Bible, which he does, despite his distaste for the book's graphic depictions of violence and sex. As he reads about Jesus' crucifixion, he puts on some classical music and closes his eyes. Asked by Chaplin about a new program that shortens phrases, Alex inquires about it. Alex insists on being suggested even if the Chaplin says he disapproves of it. Experimental software is Ludovico's technique. No matter what, Alex must participate in the technique as punishment for his involvement in a fight. Doctors refer to it as the reclamation method. In his apology to Alex, the Chaplin expresses his deep regret for what is about to happen. It's another experimental treatment designed to get rid of the desire to harm people. Alex will be released from prison when the treatment is finished. Alex feels the idea that the state will turn him into a decent lad is ridiculous. A doctor named Branham meets Alex the following day in a hospital-like setting. There are various comforts provided to help Alex through the treatment. He is only required to watch some special films as part of the process. He must have a supplement pumped into him after each meal, which is what Alex believes it is. When he wakes up the next morning, the man is chained to a chair in the middle of an enormous room with a gigantic screen. The chair is equipped with eyelid opening clamps that keep him awake at all times. An old man, tortured and stripped naked by two young men, must be watched by Alex, who is already weak after his first injection. After that, he sees a gruesome movie about a young girl who is gang raped and raped to death. Alex notices that he is reacting differently to the violence in the flicks than he generally does. He feels nauseated when viewing them. He's baffled as to how the movies, which look to be real, could have been made with the victim's cooperation. Dr. Brodsky, a doctor who monitors Alex's reactions through wires attached to the chair, forces him to watch progressively violent flicks. The films are making Alex sicker and sicker, and he begs physicians to turn them off. In the physician's eyes, he's nothing but a laughing stock. Dr. Branham pays a visit to Alex in his room after he has finished his work for the day. A few days after Branham tells Alex that his brain is in the process of learning that violence is wrong, he feels sick. After Alex departs, he ruminates on the wicked things he still intends to do once he is released from prison. Alex is visited by a man known as a discharge officer, who spends some time chatting with him. In order to gauge Alex's reaction to his treatment, the doctor asks him one more time, would you like to punch me? When Alex tries to hit the man, he fails and immediately falls unwell, just like in the movies. A violent dream Alex had that night causes him to vomit in the morning. He discovers that he is unable to leave his room and must wait for the sickness to subside before doing so. He shivers in his bed, unable to fall asleep. Alex starts his treatment the following day and explodes in rage as Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is played in one of the videos. Despite his repeated pleas, the doctors are baffled by his reaction to the soundtrack. Alex's physicians have informed him that he is being put through an associative learning program. They're inoculating him with something that will make him sick before exposing him to violent videos in order to teach his brain that violence is immoral. When Alex tells them he's learned his lesson, they chuckle and pat him on the shoulder, despite Alex's assurances. Alex's treatment continues for a long period of time. All of his efforts to rebel have failed. After a while, Alex finds that his nausea and headaches are no longer caused by cables and injections, but rather by the film. He bursts into sobs at this understanding. While trying to escape in the middle of the night, Alex raises his fist in an attempt to attack an orderly but is overcome with nausea and stumbles. His face is hit by an orderly's fist. Having received the punch, Alex knows that it is better for him to receive one than to give one. Including his razor, Alex receives all of his former possessions back on the final day of his treatment. Instead of a screen, a panel of well-dressed men sits to judge him this time when he returns to the screening room. In Dr. Brodsky's instructions, the men are instructed to observe Alex as an example of good citizenship. Alex is taunted and pinched by an elderly man, and he wishes he could grab for his razor, but he gets sick just thinking about it. Aware of the man's hatred, Alex knows he must change it. Despite his best efforts, he gets slapped out of his razor by the man. Alex licks the man's boots and clings to his ankles until the man falls over in a desperate attempt to flee the situation. Even though the physicians are making fun of him, Alex feels bad for the man and helps him up. In response to Brodsky's summons, the man exits the room. When Alex thinks about being aggressive, Brodsky informs the panel that it causes him instant physical pain, and as a result, he has to be decent to avoid it. When the panelists start arguing, Alex says aloud, What about me? Am I simply to be a clockwork orange? Alex is concerned by the dispute. Alex is scolded by a panel member for speaking, and the debate resumes. There is a gorgeous girl when Brodsky calls for the second volunteer. 
Despite Alex's best intentions, the disease overpowers him and he is forced to prostrate himself before her in a show of devotion. Alex feels like a fool after the girl leaves, and he wishes he hadn't succumbed to the doctor's ruse. Brodsky informs the panel that Alex has transformed into a true Christian who is ready to turn the other cheek. Before Alex is released and left to the streets with nothing but the clothing on his back, he must endure yet another round of humiliating demonstrations and press appearances. On his way to get breakfast at a diner, he comes across a photo in the newspaper of himself from one of the seminars. A companion piece discusses his treatment and the implications for criminal behavior in the future. There are less trash cans on the streets when Alex decides to return home. At his parents' place he is surprised to see a stranger sitting at the table with them. A man has been renting Alex's room from Alex's parents for a while now. At first his mother is afraid that Alex has broken out of prison, but he assures her that this was not the case. In fact, when Alex returns to his room, he discovers that all of his belongings have been taken. His father reveals that the police confiscated all of his belongings as compensation for his victim. His belongings ended up in the care of the old woman's cats in this instance. To avoid becoming sick, Alex must smile constantly. When Joe, the lodger, tries to chastise him, his father tells him that he can't be there. Alex breaks down and walks away from his parents' house in tears. His love of classical music is severely dented after hearing Ludovico Technique, so he returns to the record store where he used to buy his records and begs to hear Mozart's 40th Symphony. Next, he visits the Karova and orders a milk drink that induces hallucinations. He begins to contemplate suicide as he drinks and hallucinates. During his investigation for painless methods of suicide, Alex runs with an old guy named Jack, whom he had previously attacked in the library. When Jack sees him, he summons the other old guests of the library to attack Alex. It's impossible for Alex to protect himself even if the patrons are all weak. After Alex has been brutally beaten, he asks the librarian to phone the police, who arrive shortly thereafter. Alex is taken aback when the officers arrive and reveal that they include Billy Boy and Dim. Alex's treatment has reached Dim and Billy Boy. Presumably because he provoked library users, Alex has been expelled and viciously beaten before being left to fend for himself in the wilds. Instead of returning to town, Alex heads to a farming community after hearing the sound of a tractor. He knocks on the door of a cottage and asks the man who answers for a glass of water. When Alex defeated him two years ago, he lived in that same cottage as the man who now resides there. When he doesn't recognize Alex, he gives him food and money. Protester who has read Alex's newspaper piece and wants to dislodge the current government with the help of Alex. He tells Alex that his wife died two years ago from shock after being raped. A second manuscript of A Clockwork Orange is discovered by Alex while spending the night in the man's cottage. This book is about a man's belief that individuals are the fruit of a tree established by God, and Alex discovers this through perusing the manuscript. To quench his hunger for love, God need the fruit. However, certain people are at risk of becoming robots as the modern world progresses. As he discovers the man's name is F. Alexander, Alex doubts his sanity. That morning, Alex is greeted by F. Alexander who tells him that he has been writing an article about him and chatting to his associates on the phone. Alex is cheerful. Unconsciously, Alex says, I didn't know that he was on the phone at the time, recalling the attack on F. Alexander's residence the night before. F. Alexander gets tense at first, but he rapidly gets over his apprehension. F. Alexander becomes suspicious when Alex employs Drew Lingo when communicating with him, as he recalls the slang from the time his home was broken into. Zetalon, Rubenstein, and D.B. Three of F. Alexander's associates, enter and show their admiration for Alex. Delon wishes Alex looked more exhausted and beaten down, which enrages Alex and causes him to revert to his vernacular. To Alex, the men's treatment of him as a pawn in their political game vexes him still further. For some reason, F. Alexander's eyes begin to glow with an uncanny intensity as Alex launches into an expletive-laden tirade. In the city, Delon takes Alex's arm and the men take him to a flat. They want to know if Alex is to blame for F. Alexander's wife's death before they depart, so they confront him about it. Alex responds that he has paid for his misdeeds, and then he begins to feel ill as a result of this. Alexander curled himself in a ball and drifted off to sleep. The sound of classical music playing in another room makes him sick again when he wakes up. When he tries to leave the room, he discovers that he has been chained there. He urges them to stop playing music by banging on the walls. He begs God for aid as he stumbles about the room. Alex stumbles across two brochures on the floor. Death to the government and open the window to fresh air, fresh ideas, a new way of living are two of the slogans on the flyers. His reaction is to leap from the window in fear. Before jumping, Alex prays for God to forgive the world for ruining him. 
Alex's fall does not kill him, but he is gravely injured and unable to stand on his own two feet. In his mind, the colleagues of F. Alexander were out to get him because of their political views. When Alex falls asleep, he wakes up in the hospital a week later. Many of Alex's teeth have been knocked out in the accident. As physicians treat to him, he lapses in and out of consciousness. When he awakens one day, F. Alexander and his associates are congratulating him on a job well done and serving liberty. The governor and other politicians are vilified in newspaper headlines, and Alex tries to scream at them, but his broken mouth prevents him from doing so. Their son Joe has come home after being brutally abused by the police and is now staying with Alex's parents. To make amends for abandoning him, they agree to let Alex return home. Alex tells them to go and tells them that if he returns, they'll have to follow his rules. For the first time, Alex is able to focus on his ideas without feeling sick when he has violent thoughts. He inquires about his head, and the nurse responds with a nonspecific response. Deep hypnopedia eventually cures the man's sickness, according to the doctor who examined him. Photographers and reporters are also there when the Minister of the Interior visits Alex later in the day. He apologizes to Alex and claims that the government never intended to harm him. Furthermore, he claims that Alex has been treated and will be given a job upon his discharge from the hospital. For Alex's sake, F. Alexander has been put away. Alex is told by the minister to consider him a friend. Minister gives Alex a huge stereo to listen to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on before he leaves. A few while later, Alex is discharged from the hospital. Len, Rick and Bully join him at the Karova in the last chapter. There is no clear plan for the night for Alex and the others, and Alex wonders whether he has grown tired of this cycle of thievery and violence. Before bringing his droogs out into the street, Alex smacks another patron in the stomach. Bully is instructed by Alex to beat up an elderly man by the droogs. In the following chapter, Alex meets up with the women he met at the Duke of New York. This time, Alex rejects their advances. A newspaper clipping falls out of his pocket as soon as he pulls out his money clip and promises to buy them a drink. A baby is depicted on the cutting. Alex is mocked for being too soft by the droogs after they get their hands on it. To everyone's surprise, Alex rips the photo apart and yells at the group. He scolds them for taking advantage of the defenseless and deems them vile. Alex heads out of the bar on his own and notices that he's missing something. When I ask him about his musical tastes, he says that his current preference is for operatic German love songs rather than classical symphonies. In the course of a chance encounter with Pete, Alex discovers that he is now married and has left his Drew days behind him. He and Georgina are now able to make ends meet on their combined wages. Alex is astounded at how much Pete has matured. He walks away from him and sits at a cafe for a while, contemplating the meaning of his existence. Alex, who will be 18 in a few months, is contemplating his future as a composer and recalls all of the greats who were in his position when they were. As Alex makes his way out of the cafe, he envisions his future family, including a wife and a son. He thinks it's a good concept. In Alex's eyes, this is what it means to be an adult, and he views childhood as little more than a wind-up toy full of problems. Alex has come to terms with the fact that he is no longer a child. Characters Alex, the lead character and narrator. There are few things Alex enjoys more than committing crimes and extreme acts of violence just for the sake of doing so. It's no surprise that Alex utilizes a stylized lingo known as Nadsat to tell the story of the novel, just like the other youngsters. He spends the majority of the novel describing his delight in cruel violence as though it were usual and does not appear to conceive that anyone else would have a different opinion. Alex is a profoundly unsympathetic protagonist throughout the work, describing his pleasure in cruel violence as if it were usual and ignoring the fact that others may have a different perspective. One of Alex's most defining characteristics is his passion for classical music. Classical music appeals to Alex because he sees crime and violence as art forms in their own right. Alex is demonstrated to experience a joy that is near to religious or even sexual when he is listening to the music. Alex uses the most musical language in the book to describe his most brutal deeds, further demonstrating his connection between violence and music in his mind. It's unusual that Alex tries to explain or defend his behavior in the context of society at large. Short, anti-intellectual replies are given to questions about the basis of his rage and aggression by others. As Alex sees it. Taking away a man's violent side would be denying him the right to be a person. The characters of most novels undergo some sort of transformation or growth, but Alex arguably doesn't. By the end of the novel, he has the impression that he is no longer a child and that he would like to marry and start a family of his own someday. However, the use of the same scene work from the beginning of the novel in the last scene shows that Alex has not progressed as far as he thinks and may not have evolved at all. To show how far Alex has come, 
and how little he has changed, the last scene uses the same type of scene work that opens the novel. F. Alexander, is one Alex's main antagonists. In the beginning of the novel, Alex and his gang attack F. Alexander, a writer and political rebel, in his home. The title of the book is taken directly from F. Alexander's manuscript. Alex and F. Alexander are often referred to as being polar opposites in personality. F. Alexander, an older, more reserved character who is described as clever, is the antithesis of Alex, a young man who lives by impulse. F. Alexander has a broader, more conceptual outlook than Alex. F. Alexander agrees to help Alex only because he sees him as a victim of the modern society and not a defenseless child when he comes at his door. He can't come up with an explanation when Alex asks F. Alexander how he wants to use his treatment by the government to benefit others. F. Alexander's optimism that man is still capable of goodness and compassion for assisting others is admirable, given that he has encountered man's worst. That doesn't mean Alex isn't capable of seeing himself as a person, rather, it's unclear if he can view Alex as the boy who beat him and raped his wife. Dr. Brodsky, state doctor in charge of Alex's experimental therapy. Brodsky is shown to have an admittedly cruel side, as he frequently chuckles at Alex's misery and dismisses most of the boy's concerns with a hand wave or a pat on the shoulder. Unlike F. Alexander, Brodsky does not seem to consider Alex as an individual but rather a tool for achieving his goal. There is a state grant in Brodsky's case for his brainwashing method of making violent crimes seem like they are the result of a severe disease. Brodsky shows no mercy to Alex, but he also doesn't appear to despise him. Like F. Alexander's manuscript, he sees him as a mechanical being. Brodsky declares Alex cured at the end of the treatment and releases him back into the community without hesitation. Dim, a member of Alex's gang of drugs who later became a police officer while Alex is in prison. In the group, Dim is defined as a large and muscular but unintelligent boy who is only employed for raw strength. A chain is Dim's weapon of choice in the same way that Alex employs a blade. When Alex is robbing the manse, it is he who mostly betrays Alex, since he frequently engages in physical altercations with Alex. Dim lashes out at Alex once more after becoming a police officer, this time beating him in a field. Pete, a member of Alex's drugs. Pete is the group's most reserved and mild-mannered member. The only one who does not challenge Alex for leadership in the gang is him, despite the fact that he continues to commit violent acts. In the three years Pete spends away from the drugs, Alex discovers that he is married with a family and leading a peaceful, quiet existence. Alex is swayed by Alex's apparent contentment with his lifestyle and wonders if he, too, may benefit from it. Biography of John Anthony Burgess Wilson On February 17, 1917, John Anthony Burgess Wilson was born in Harper Hay, Lancashire. Burgess was raised in a Catholic household during the Great Depression, but his father had a tobacco and alcohol shop, so his family was well off. In 1918, Burgess lost both his mother and his sister to the Spanish flu. His aunt Anne took care of Burgess for a time after his mother's death until his father remarried in 1922. In 1938, Burgess' father died and leaving him with nothing. Bachelor of Arts in English, 1938, Xavierian College, New York City. Burgess married Lula Isherwood Jones in 1942 after meeting at university. By 1945, Burgess had served in the Royal Army Medical Corps and was promoted to sergeant in the Army Educational Corps during World War II. The Midwest School of Education in Wolverhampton hired Burgess as a lecturer in drama and speech after the war, where he taught for several years. A grammar school in Banbury hired him to teach English in 1950. His early novels were written while he was teaching in Malaya as part of the British Colonial Service, including Time for a Tiger, 1956, and The Enemy in the Blanket, 1958. He also authored and published Beds in the East, 1959. 1959. It was eventually referred to as the Malayan Trilogy for these works. After leaving Malaya, Burgess went on to Brunei, where he was hired as a teacher. For reasons that have never been fully explained, Burgess and his wife were soon expelled from Brunei. A brain tumor was found to be inoperable in Burgess, who was immediately hospitalized. He began frantically writing, desperate to provide his wife with a source of income after he was no longer able to do so. In 1960, he published three more books, and in 1961, he published two more books. When Burgess returned to the hospital, doctors found no evidence of a brain tumor. He was able to quit teaching and become a full-time author at this point since he had made so much money from selling novels. It was in 1962 that Burgess published A Clockwork Orange, which would become the author's best-known book. Liliana Macalari, an Italian translator, had started an affair with Burgess at this point. 
Paolo Burgess was born to Macalari and Burgess in 1964. Six months after Burgess's wife died of liver disease in 1968, he married Liana. He and his family traveled Europe during this time period and briefly relocated to the United States, where Burgess served as a visiting lecturer at Princeton University. Once in Monaco, he co-founded the Princess Grace Irish Library and a Center for Irish Cultural Studies in 1984, which he continues to serve as a board member of. On November 22, 1993, Burgess died of lung cancer at his home in Twickenham, England. Returned to Monaco, his ashes were buried in the Monaco Cemetery. His wife and son, who died in 2007 and 2002, were the only people left to care for him. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Don't forget to subscribe and smash that like button for more content like this, see you in next video.